Hey, just before we get started, this is a conspiracy, paranormal, and true crime podcast. The nature of this podcast is gory, unsettling, and definitely vulgar. And we curse a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. So be advised. So we're just two idiots with a mic. Yo, 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 and welcome back to Creeps and Crimes Podcast. I'm Taylor. And I'm Morgan, and this is episode 93. 93, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. And if you're new here. Welcome. Welcome. Happy we Thursday. Have a lot of new listeners popping in every week. Yeah, we do. And I have a feeling that this one's going to have a bit of a spike. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because we're doing something really cool. So for yeah. everybody that's new, um, we haven't really given you guys a rundown in a long time. I literally think since episode one. <laughs> yeah. So unless like our listeners are starting from the beginning, they're probably like, we're so confused. So yeah. we're going to kind of run, give you guys a run through of mm-hmm. how our episodes usually work. Mm-hmm. Um, usually I'll go first with a conspiracy segment or a paranormal segment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, followed by Miss True, True Crime, Crime Queen, Miss True Crime Taylor J over here. Yeah, that's who it is, and she'll just tear it up at the end. Yeah, I'll just ruin everybody's week. But every but now and that's then. why we like to start off on a really good note, and we do these little intros. They run between five to ten minutes. Most of the time, it's a ten minute long. Sometimes longer. Sometimes longer if we haven't been together in a minute, because the second we walk into the house, the studio, whatever, together, we have to get on the mic, or else you don't get any content because we'll talk about it all beforehand. Yep, we've been kind of slacking at that lately. <laughs> been really running our mouths we talking haven't. way too much before we record and then it's time to do the intro and we're like oh boy oh man but then patreon's like no you guys don't shut up yeah patreon's like you guys literally have started your own <laughs> segment for intros called you pipe and hot glass separate, you started a separate entire entity of yeah, recordings we did. For, we did we did that because our intros on patreon and you only know this if you're a patreon they're dangerous they're dangerous they're dangerous we say a lot of things that mm, that are questionable yeah and um we need to be able to take them back if we want to yeah they're definitely like tmis (laughs) yeah (laughs) they're for sure tmis they're tmis and they're tfus all in one all in one all in one tmi times TFU. like really though we should have just made pipe and hot gloss tfu yeah yeah but pipe phg is better phg i really love the way hot yeah anyway so me and morgan um are best friends and we became best friends in college for those who don't know yeah but yeah now we do this together and now we're just podcasters now we're podcasters we just sit on the couch we've changed our studio location like eight times yeah from one bedroom to another bedroom to a different office to a bed to to the straight up couch (laughs) <laughs> to a foyer yeah we're still on the couch we're, we've been like loving the couch life we have been loving the couch life it's a lot more relaxing and we can see each other i actually fell asleep during taylor's <laughs> patreon segment the other day <laughs> she did fall asleep i was sick okay first off she's sick and it was like 10 30 at night that's like an hour and a half after her bedtime yeah because yeah, she has to work really early that's on facts yeah for sure um but morgan is still kind of lingering sick but tell them why because yeah it's a good okay reason. so i just got back from sorry marley's wedding um a couple days ago and it was in Colorado. Every time I come back from Colorado, I'm just Ill. piping hot sick. Piping hot sick. Period. Yeah. And I, Nettie pop. Nettie it's pop. It's the altitude. It's the different air changes, the dry yeah. air to the wet air. And I get so, so sick. And so, anyway, I've been dealing with that. And I'm still sick. I feel much better. But anyway, let's get the show on the yeah, road. We're it. super excited for this case. Yep. Taylor specifically has really worked her butt off on this and... Let's do it. I'm nervous. Let's go. If you're em. driving, throw that shit on cruise control. If you got a glass, pour that shit up. And let's get creepy. All right, guys. So we already told you that this is going to be a little bit of a different episode um, because you're not going to be getting your typical creepy story from Morgan. No, ma'am. No aliens, no ghosts, no not today. conspiracies today because she is going to help me out in this case. And we really need an entire episode to be able to give you all of the details you're going to need to understand and help us in this case, which is why we're going to be telling it to you because this is mainly a a call 
call for action. As most of you guys know, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Tennessee, and so were my parents. I typically stay very far away from my hometown true crime cases because my family still lives there. I own property there. My in-laws live there, and it's a small town. Small, small. (laughs) It may not look like it on a map anymore because it is rapidly growing, but if you were raised there, we know everything about everyone. And all of these cases are extremely sensitive for me because I know these people, they know me, and name, places, people, family dynamics, the true story, they always linger around from house to house, making this extremely dangerous for me to do, as it could possibly put me and my family at risk. I am known for not holding back, and I don't plan to, especially in this case, because this victim, they deserve the spotlight that they have been denied for so long. No one is safe in cases like this. News travels fast and always makes its way up to the top. With that being said, Morgan and I together will be covering a case from the Chattanooga and Cleveland, Tennessee area. This was brought to me by one of my friends from high school named MK, and she connected me with her best friend, who is a listener of the podcast, Ashley. Ashley is married to Yuri Davis, who was actually friends with my mama in high school. That's how small of a town we're in, okay? Oh, wow. And Yuri's brother, Marty, was murdered. Marty's case is still unsolved to this day. Ashley and Yuri have come to us, as in you, our listeners, to help bring Marty the justice he deserves. This is the case of Marty Davis. Let's do it. Charles Martin, or Marty Davis, was born on February 22, 1962, to Tom and Iva Dean Davis in Cleveland, Tennessee. Marty was the youngest of the couple's four children, Tommy, Valerie, and Mitzi. From a very young age, Marty's personality and who he was at his core was extremely evident. Always kind, polite, smart, engaging, and an amazing storyteller who was always willing to lend a hand at any time to someone in need. When Marty was younger, his father, Tom, and mother, Iva Dean, divorced because of Iva Dean's struggles with alcoholism, and Tom later remarried. When Marty was staying with his father and new stepmother, Debbie, he never acted like the teen he actually was. Instead, he was extremely mature for his age, offering to do the dishes, pick up after his new younger sibling, Yuri, and always ready to have dinnertime conversation with his dad, stepmother, and stepsister. But even still, Marty was secretly struggling. His mother's alcohol alcoholism only worsened, causing Marty to move around the Cleveland and Chattanooga area a lot as a kid. He felt like he couldn't be who he really was openly, and he was constantly filling others' cups, yet his was often left empty. Chris, or Christina, a close friend of Marty's later in life, told Ashley during a phone call that in these moments when he was younger and he felt like he was alone and he couldn't fight through another day, he would watch Mr. Rogers and what kept him going was the final line of every show, quote, you've made this a special day by just your being you. There is no person in the world like you. And I like you just the way you are. Marty was an amazing human. And on top of all of this, he was extremely intelligent. In 1980, he graduated from Cleveland High School, my alma mater. Go Raiders. Go Raiders, guys. And he was given many awards and honors at graduation. After high school, he got a full ride to the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, where he majored in pre-law. He would often return to Cleveland and intern with different attorneys, one being attorney John Howard. Hagler and John Hagler later becomes a judge for Cleveland and we'll hear more about him in Morgan's segment. These two created a lifelong friendship not only because of the this like internship but because they also went to the same church. After graduating from the University of Tennessee Chattanooga Marty realized that law school just wasn't for him so instead he decided to switch it up and go to the University of Virginia for his master's in international economics on again another full ride scholarship. During Marty's time in college, he became a lot more comfortable with his sexuality and he came out as gay to his friends and family. Unfortunately, this ended up being a really rough time for Marty as it was the mid to late 80s in the South and a very small town in the Bible Belt. 
but he stayed true to himself and the people who loved him eventually came around realizing that they can give all of the hellfire and brimstone talks that they want but it wasn't going to change who marty was and who he loved after this marty felt a new calling why is it so hard for these people to accept him for who he truly is for what made him happy the church they're taught that hate in church but that's not the God that Marty knew. And he wanted to share that with others. Love is love. Love is eternal. Love is God. So he decided to go back to school. After graduating from UVA, Marty went to seminary for his master's in divinity at Swanee, which is the University of the South. It is a private Episcopal liberal arts college in Swanee, Tennessee that is owned by the 28 Southern Diocese. Swanee's School of Theology is the official seminary of the Episcopalian Church. And what led him to this was his work with the Episcopal Church as a youth group leader for St. Luke's Episcopal in Cleveland where he worked alongside Judge John Hagler, who we discussed earlier, who he did his internship with. And he also volunteered each summer at Camp Billy Johnson. According to their website, Camp Billy Johnson is a ministry of the Episcopal Diocese of East Tennessee, named in memory of the Reverend Billy Johnson. Billy was rector of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Knoxville and had a passion for ministry with at-risk youth. Billy was killed in a plane crash in 1980, and the camp was then renamed in his memory as it operated on many of the principles he preached for working with inner city youth with an emphasis for one-on-one -on -one care and attention. At Camp Billy Johnson, no camper pays and the high school and adult staff are volunteers. Oh my God, of course Marty loved this place. Of course. <laughs> Before we go on, let's discuss the Episcopalian Church. It is classified as a Christian Protestant church like Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, and many more. And this originated in the 16th century Reformation, rejecting the Catholic doctrine. Historically, members of the Episcopal Church have held many leadership roles in American politics, businesses, sciences, arts, and education. Literally three quarters of the signers on the Declaration of Independence were affiliates of the Episcopal Church. Oh my gosh. Which at the time was intertwined with the Church of England. Oh wow. Since then, over a quarter of the United States presidents have been Episcopalians. Whoa. In the mid-1900s, the Episcopal Church began more liberal preachings, supporting and joining in the civil rights movement, opposing the death penalty, and calling for full legal equality of LGBTQ plus people. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Love Episcopal Church. Even passing resolutions that allowed for the blessing the union of same-sex marriages by the church. Their beliefs and practices surround the life, teachings, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that human beings are part of God's creation made in the image of God. Therefore, they're free to make choices to love, reason, and live in harmony with creation and God. There's a strong emphasis on prayer. Specifically, they use the Lord's Prayer as foundation. They observe the ancient church year, meaning Advent, Christmas, Easter, Lent, etc., along with the celebration of holy days dedicated to the saints. They believe that sacraments are outward and visible signs of God's inward and spiritual grace. Baptism and Holy Communion are necessary for members. Infant baptisms is practiced and encouraged. And other sacraments are confirmation, ordination, marriage, confession, and anointing. And they also believe in an Episcopal form of government meaning the threefold order of bishops, priests, and deacons. Unlike some other churches, men, women, non-binary, and transgender individuals are eligible for ordination to the clergy. The Episcopal Church is governed by a general convention and in the United States consists of 100 dioceses, and for every diocese, there is a bishop. A diocese is a region, and in the United States, there are grouped into nine provinces. The province of Swanee, or P4, consists of the southeastern states, but specifically the Diocese of East Tennessee, with Bishop Robert Bob Tharp as the bishop from 1992 to 1999, which is the bishop that Marty was later ordained under. The highest legislative body of the Episcopal Church is the General Convention, which consists of the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops, which are all bishops leading a diocese. The vestry of each parish, which is like a church congregation leadership board, elects a priest, which is called the rector, a.k.a. the head honcho, the head priest. Head honcho, head priest. The rector has a spiritual jurisdiction in the parish and selects both deacons and priests. Deacons are baptized members of the Episcopal Church who are called, formed, and ordained to lead God's people. But essentially, they are volunteers and get no pay from the church. The hierarchy according to the Episcopal Holy Orders is 1. Bishops who are the highest of the Holy Orders, 
two, the rector or priest, who are the second highest, and three, the deacons, who are the third highest. Priests can perform mass in all sacraments, whereas deacons cannot, meaning priests are the assistants to the bishop, while deacons are servants of the church. We already discussed provinces, parishes, and dioceses, but for every province there is a mission budget and a synod. The synod is like a council that does administrative work for their province. The process of becoming an Episcopal priest is lengthy and can be extremely challenging for some. Before even applying to seminary, you must meet with your bishop and commission after gaining the support of your rector and parish committee discussing ministry. And they have to approve of you as a candidate, basically approving your admission into a religious order. Once you gain their approval, then you can apply to seminary of the Episcopal Church to get your master's in divinity which is a three-year program. As you wait to be admitted, you are to write Ember Day letters to your bishop, which is basically you expressing your desire to have a close relationship with your bishop and God that reflects phases of your spiritual journey during times of prayer and fasting. These are to be written four different times throughout the year. Then you must apply to your bishop, commission on ministry, and standing committee to move forward in the process of being considered a candidate for ordination, aka become a deacon. <laughs> this is literally like how to become the president of the United States. <laughs> I swear to God, I think it'd be easier to be a president than it is swear. to be a priest. <laughs> and once you get accepted to seminary, you take the GOE, which is the general ordination exam exam at the end of your first year. It is a five-day exam in which you are given three hours to write each essay. Lastly, during your third year of seminary, you are to apply for ordination to the priesthood. If you are accepted, you are ordained as a priest upon graduation. But throughout your time in seminary, you are immersed into this very religious community and almost cut off from all other forms of life outside the church. You are to use this time to prove your calling to God. However, because of how isolated you are during your time at seminary, leaving can be challenging for some because you're in, in this little bubble. Reality can hit you very hard when returning home, which is why it is very important to have a mentor by your side throughout the entire process, especially at Swanee because of how far it is in the middle of nowhere woods no like it is literally if you guys haven't looked up swanee first off look it up it, it's gorgeous like it is a beautiful beautiful campus but it is literally in bfe there is and you're Guaranteed. like in the woods you're straight up in the woods in the mountains in southern tennessee it's yeah. crazy but marty did amazing at seminary everyone in his class and all of his professors were obsessed with his preaching style his ability to encourage hype up engage and swiftly transform those who are listening to him he was literally made to preach the word of god and when he graduated from seminary in 1991 he was the youngest person at the time to be ordained in the state of tennessee as a priest at the age of 29 heck yes like, marty Marty. Let's go. But so much more than that, he was the first openly gay Episcopal priest in the Chattanooga area. I was just about to say, I bet he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good for and him. That's Marty amazing. was forcefully making a path for others who loved like him, and he did it fearlessly with grace, compassion, determination, and love. Marty loved the Episcopal Church for many reasons, as I've already stated, but mainly it was the peace that the denomination brought to him, the feelings of comfort that it provided him with with its open arms mentality and beautiful style. Episcopalian churches are very orderly. They are dim, very clean, and they smell amazing. Every one I've ever been into just smells phenomenal, and they have lots of decorations and candles like very like almost catholic but more like gothic to marty the church felt more like the one constant in his life just because of how often he was moved around in cluttered homes as a child after graduating from seminary episcopalian priests are required to serve as a deacon in their area for at least six months while waiting for your rector assignment from your bishop marty served as a deacon at the saint peter's episcopal church in chattanooga tennessee during this time marty began requesting to be a assigned to St. Mary's the Virgin in Chattanooga. St. Mary's was an African-American Episcopal church that, according to an article written by the Chattanooga Times in 1996, was founded in 1915 by the St. Mary's congregation because of segregation. Friends of Marty's were confused as to why he would want to be assigned to this parish as it was extremely small and in missionary status. Missionary status is essentially when you're not fully qualified to be a parish yet. That basically means that you're having to be 
supported financially by an external organization, which in this case was the diocese. Plus, he would literally be this like young little white priest leading an African American congregation. Like, would they even be open to having a white priest? Because again, this is the early 1990s, and though people literally don't want to acknowledge this, but segregation was still very much around, especially in Chattanooga, especially in the South. Especially the Bible Belt. Yes, for sure. But also, because of being in missionary status, St. Mary's only had a very small, basically cinder block building that they gathered in. There were no decorations, no paint on the walls, nothing, but Marty loved it there. He loved the members, the deacons, the message, and he wanted to help transform this mission into a parish. Good for him. Right, and Marty got his assignment there, and he was there as a rector. He was so thrilled, and so were the members. They loved his preaching style, his enthusiasm, kindness, and young heart. Marty went above and beyond for St. Mary's, using his own savings to transform their building, buying decorations, rugs, painting all of the walls. He was adorned by this church, even though, to more traditional Episcopalians, he was kind of looked down upon because of the fact that he always wore different colored tennis shoes, like colorful crazy ones, Love with that. like crazy socks um, under under his vestments yeah (laughs) and a vestment is like basically like the formal wear of an episcopalian priest so like the robe the sash the cords etc you know what i'm talking about but on a personal life note marty had just came back from seminary and was getting reacclimated to regular life he was living in an apartment in downtown chattanooga that was so cute by the way um i got to see some pictures of it and like feeling out being a priest a 29 year old and an openly gay man in the bible belt south so he started surrounding himself with great people and that includes one of his best friends named michael michael was originally from chattanooga but moved to louisiana for college and became a nurse michael moved back to chattanooga where he went back to school for his second degree and began working in hospitals the two of them basically moved back to chattanooga at the same time and were getting used to being back in their like hometown and they happened to both be at alan gold's one night in 1991 alan gold is a multi-level gay dance and drag bar which yes. I think we have to go to because it's still open. Yes. Um, but Michael was chatting around the bar, like walking around the dance floor area when this guy came up to him and was like making him feel extremely uncomfortable, like a creep. Marty, who just happened to be walking by, noticed Michael's body language was in need of saving, a.k.a. every girl and gay knows this distress signal. Right. And we use this often, even to save, like, complete strangers. For sure. So Marty did what any of us would do and went up to Michael and that creepy guy acting like him and Michael were best friends ever and ever and ever, and they came together and their other friend was ready to go and that he needed to go with Marty. But what the two didn't know at the time is that this would be the start of one of the most beautiful friendships of all time literally the creeps to his crimes Aww, that's so cute after that michael and marty spent almost every single day together and michael moved in to marty's apartment spare room they were both episcopalian they shared the same love for fun and humor in 1993 with marty still working at saint mary's as the rector marty actually bought a home on sunbeam avenue in chattanooga tennessee and it is the cutest home in the world like it's got a cute front porch and a back porch porch with a backyard that is like so adorable I'll show you pictures of it can't wait Michael rented the second bedroom from Marty and the two hosted back porch dinners and drinks almost every single Sunday which literally sounds like so much fun and like we would be we there. love back porch hangs we love a back we would have been there yeah we would have been there I love a good fire pit uh, um, rocking chair with nice wine. stringy lights in the back yep, string. and he did oh my god he that's that's what Michael did. said on the call with Ashley he said yeah we used to have um twinkle lights <laughs> And I was like, okay, you started the trend. I didn't even know that. And I love it. Yeah, right. Okay. So as an Episcopalian uh, rector, you have to become close with the other parish rectors in your area, which is how Marty was introduced to Reverend Christina, who I discussed earlier, or Chris, of Thankful Memorial Episcopalian. Thankful Memorial was a very wealthy parish and it had a gorgeous church but it was an all-white church which Morgan will dive into the history of here in a little bit. What is really awesome about Chris is that she was the first female rector in the Chattanooga area meaning that she and Marty really leaned on each other while navigating and leading this new wave of change in the area. Chris would join Marty and Michael for dinner and porch hangs often and there Marty and Chris would manifest about these massive changes that they wanted to make to the Chattanooga Episcopalian community. 
community. And their main conversations were really surrounding the merging of their churches. Oh, wow. This would be huge for the Chattanooga area, but specifically the St. Elmo community, which is where they were in Chat, like a little suburb of Chattanooga, and where each of their churches were located. By the end of 1994, Chris and Marty were ready to propose this merge to the diocese. And the diocese fully supported this merge, especially for what it would mean for this area and agreed to help them merge financially. Though this was extremely helpful, there are many steps that have to be taken for a merge to be successful for both parties, especially with the covenants that are in place because of Thankful Memorial's history that Morgan's going to take us through. According to Thankful Memorial's website, the history of the church starts with a man named Colonel A.M. Johnson from Gainesville, Georgia. In 1851, Johnson and his brother-in-law, John Bryson, moved to Chattanooga to be in the tanning industry, leather making. (laughs) Because I'm thinking like, oh, they opened Suntan City, huh? (laughs) They opened Suntan City, (laughs) got it. Which was prominent in the area because of the Nashville-Chattanooga Railroad Line, which was the first train operating railroad in Tennessee that we now know as I-24. Mm-hmm. Colonel Johnson later started working as a post office agent with the railroad line and met a woman named Thankful Anderson Whiteside, the daughter of one of the founders of early Chattanooga and established the Nashville Chattanooga Railroad, Representative Colonel James A. Whiteside. Colonel Johnson and Thankful later got married, after which Johnson became the superintendent of the Will Valley Railroad. For reference, Chattanooga is like a major railroad city, and the Whitesides played a massive role in this, so they were extremely well-respected and wealthy. Yes. During the Civil War, Johnson was assigned to operate several railroads in North Georgia as a colonel for the Confederates and after the war was able to return home to Chattanooga, only to discover their home, land, and belongings had been destroyed during the battles for Chattanooga, which almost completely destroyed the city because of the location. Johnson became the president of Lookout Savings and with three others, purchased the city water company that had been built by Union soldiers, which is what he spent the next 17 years supervising as Chattanooga just constructed all of the water systems in the area. In 1878, the outbreak of yellow fever caused Chattanooga Valley residents to flee into the surrounding mountains in order to avoid the disease plaguing the city. Thankful Whiteside had inherited hundreds of acres of property from her family. So, in 1886, with the massive demand for mountain home because of residents fleeing, Johnson became began subdividing lots of his wife's east side farm property on the eastern slope of Lookout Mountain and selling them. Naming this community St. Elmo after Augusta Evans' novel, who was thankful very close friend and because from where the Johnson's home sat it overlooked the community they had built which Augusta said reminded her of the view from St. Elmo's Castle in Naples Johnson installed a water main to St. Elmo from the city and also an electric trolley car to connect St. Elmo to Chattanooga this guy's huge like, oh, yeah, bigly well, smart he wasn't it was the white sides and oh. he just well he he's like a good entrepreneur obviously because yeah. you come into money like that and you're like okay great I'm gonna do this 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 and this yeah. so yeah he actually is pretty yeah, pretty charming. <laughs> By 1887, St. Elmo Episcopalians who attended Chattanooga's St. Paul's Episcopalian Church were taking this trolley every Sunday that was packed to the brim with people in an extremely long and slow journey. So, thankful Everett, thankful Johnson's granddaughter, asked St. Paul's for permission to start a children's Sunday school in St. Elmo, which was open in October of 1893 with 18 women teaching classes there, fully supported by these women and their husbands until 1898, when it became a mission through Swanee. When Colonel Johnston died in 1903, he left the property across the street from his home to be used for an Episcopal church, and the church was to be named in memory of thankful Anderson Whiteside Johnson, who had died in 1890, along with the Whiteside Johnson family will for the church's construction and operating. The church finished construction in 1904, named Thankful Memorial Episcopal Church, built of native stone in a Gothic revival style and filled with gorgeous stained glass windows from the Johnson home. St. Paul's then loaned their church bell from 1870 to Thankful in 1911, named In Perpetuity. Fun fact, that same bell still rings at Thankful Memorial to this day. That is so cool. It's like 200 years old. Bro. That is an old ass bell. Old ass bell. Because of the Johnson's family funding of the church, Thankful Memorial was required to stay the name of it, even if any merges were to happen. It was like written in, along with many other things due to their covenant. In addition to this, because of the massive size and beauty of Thankful Memorial, along with its wealth, the two parishes would merge 
in their church. Therefore, St. Mary's was basically being dissolved and pushing their congregation over to join Thankfuls. St. Mary's didn't have much of anything to bring over and call their own after the merge, other than Marty, the fellowship hall being renamed St. Mary's Parish Hall, and the money from the cell of their church. As I stated, this was a very small, basically cinder block building in St. Elmo's in the 90s, so they only made about $65,000 from the cell, which I guess back then was probably like a big chunk, which the diocese wanted to have as reimbursement of the money that they had put into St. Mary's while it was in mission status. But Marty did not agree with this, and he fought for that money to be given to his congregation because it was literally all that they had. They had put so much love and time into that church and their congregation. It belonged to them, and they deserved to get something out of this merge. And Marty was successful, and he did this for St. Mary's. He got the money to go to Thankful Memorial with them. The issue with merging churches outside of all of this drama with like legalities is that in Episcopalian practices, there can only be one rector. Either he or Chris were going to have to step down from their rector position and become an assistant rector to whoever it was given the title. Marty didn't really care because this was Chris, his close friend, and they both knew that this merger was 50-50 and having both of them leading this church was going to be necessary for the success of the merge. But Chris wanted to remain rector badly. And to Marty, this wasn't that big of a deal, despite many of his close friends pushing for him to fight for this position. Chris remained the rector of Thankful, and Marty was her assistant rector, meaning Chris held more authority. Marty's life was extremely busy, though, so this actually gave him a little bit more leeway in the other roles that he held. Marty was a committed member of the Board for Chattanooga Cares, according to the Chattanooga Times in 1997 article that they wrote about him, which is an agent that supports individuals with AIDS and HIV. And he was also a chairman on Chattanooga Integrity, the Episcopal Ministry for the LGBTQ plus community. Not to mention his continued work with Camp Billy Johnson and all the other work that he did for the homeless. He spent hours each week delivering food, water, clothes, beds, and just giving time to these underserved communities in the area. Marty was a lover of the friendless and the needy. He shared his time, words, kindness, and belongings with anyone one he came into contact with. He even counseled members of his congregation at the church as well. All the while, he's navigating his own life, relationships, and his 30s. Marty was constantly, again, filling others' cups, as I said earlier, yet his was often left empty. And this worried those who loved him, especially his best friend and roommate, Michael. Thankful and St. Mary's celebrated their first service together on Ash Wednesday in 1995 and officially finalized their merge in December of that year. It was around this time that Marty started feeling the effects of the struggles when it comes to a merger, which really started with the fact that Chris was the rector. Specifically, the main issues were surrounding the $65,000 that St. Mary's made off of their cell. With this money, there were purchases being made that had not been approved by Marty, and this money, w money was dwindling, which felt like dwindling power for St. Mary's. Yeah, that's not cool. Right, and it's triggering for them, specifically Marty, as he felt like he had made the mistake of supporting this merge. His parish was the minority, and some members were actually pushing back when it came to the merger, but Marty promised them that he would take good care of them and be their champion. These happenings were adding lots of pressure to Marty, who was worried that his followers would feel as if they were being suppressed by thankful leaders and members who were predominantly white. Parts of St. Mary's practices were actually being pushed aside, and this was extremely upsetting. Meanwhile, Chris and Marty are trying their best to keep their friendship and work rela relationship very separate, so they would still hang out for dinners, drinks, and porch kickbacks with friends, including Michael. I know that was hard. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, because first off you're probably pissed at yeah, each other secretly, for sure. and you're trying to like act normal in front of everybody right. at this point chris was starting to see this guy named jim who worked as a dishwasher at the acropolis in chattanooga which by the way um if you're in chattanooga area you have to go to the acropolis and you have to get the strawberry cake for dessert okay 
Thank Ooh, you. It's one yummy. of my favorite restaurants. Um, but according to friends of Marty at the time, Marty had actually set up Jim and Chris to start dating. But Jim was very different from those who Marty and Michael would typically hang around with, and especially when he was around Chris. The two were in love, but Jim had his own struggles and battles that were becoming more and more evident. Despite this, they were happy and ended up getting married in October of 1995, so just before the merge was official, and soon after, Chris became pregnant. Meanwhile, Marty, through 1995 and early 1996, he began dating a lot more. And in this time and area, there was still very much the feeling of don't say gay mindset. So most of the LGBTQ plus community in Chattanooga was very close, but a lot of them were younger. Therefore, Marty was dating men that were much younger than him, and he was like 35, 36 at the time, meaning his life was pretty chaotic, and most of these men were very immature. There was lots of drinking and tons of baggage that Marty wanted to help with. It was just his nature, but it was creating a lot more stress in his life that he didn't need, and this chaos led to Marty leaning much more on alcohol to help him loosen up and chill out at the end of a hard day. But still, Marty was young and enjoyed a good time with his friends. Everyone who knew him that has spoken with Ashley and I just go on and on about how much fun Marty was. In February of 1996, Marty was driving home from the bar and he was pulled over by police. He immediately got out of the car and was like, hey, I've been drinking. I can't tell a lie. First off, I'm a priest, so I can't lie. Like, yeah, I'm drunk. I'm drunk. And so Marty was arrested and sent to the drunk tank where Chris came and bailed him out at almost seven months pregnant. He didn't have to have to like serve time other than like community service in Silverdale, which is outside of Chattanooga, which Jim, Chris's husband, helped him through. And Michael's dad would like drop him off for his like community service outings. Marty wasn't coping well with all of this. And he carried a lot of shame and embarrassment for what he had done and feared that the church would think differently of him. Around this time, Marty was also seeing a local boy named Jacob. Jacob was a lot younger than Marty and he struggled with with depression. They had only been on a few dates, but Marty really, really liked Jacob. In April, Marty received a call that trigger warning while I go into this. Jacob was in the hospital and in a coma. He had jumped off of a bridge and committed suicide. Jacob was on life support for a week, which happened to be Holy Week for the church. Marty was distraught and refused to even change his clothes, fearing that if he did, Jacob would die. He would go to the church, to the hospital, and home just to eat and sleep. When Jacob passed away, Marty was really hurting, and he needed the support of his church, which Chris could not give him because she was extremely angry with Marty for blowing off church during Holy Week, leaving her, who was extremely pregnant, to take care of everything. So she starts having conversations with Bishop up Bob Tharp about her concerns with Marty. Marty has no idea about this though. Chris was wanting Marty out of the church as a result of his DUI, personal struggles, and what she believed to be a drinking problem. Bishop Bob Tharp agreed with Chris because everyone was concerned about Marty. They decided to send Marty to a rehab facility called Hazleton in Minnesota for alcoholism. While there, Marty advocated for himself, explaining to doctors that he knew his tendencies with alcohol were stemming from depression and not alcoholism. He wanted to be treated for depression first. Doctors listened to him. Marty was checked out and transferred to a facility in Maryland. His transfer really angered the church, specifically Chris, because she felt like Marty was trying to leave rehab as a whole, like trying to get out of it. But in reality, he was really just advocating for proper proper medical care for himself so he could actually get the help that he needed to like get through this. As soon as Marty gets to the Maryland facility, he realizes that this is the facility that the dirty Catholic priests from the giant scandal (gasps) were being sent to. Oh. So he was like, yeah, I need to be moved. (laughs) I cannot be here. I don't belong here. Right. So as he's like figuring this out, he gets a call from like a deacon or someone at the church, like higher up in the church and Bishop Bob Tharp telling him that he has been fired by Chris from Thankful Memorial. 
Chris was unable to give the call herself, though, because she had gone into early labor that night, which she later says was probably caused by the stress that she felt during this entire situation. Mm. So Marty checked himself out of the facility in Maryland and got a freaking ride home because he was like, I have to figure out what to do. I have a mortgage to pay. I have no job, no income and probably some big hefty rehab bills. This all happened in May of 96 and everyone in the church was really upset with Marty for checking himself out once again. But he was honestly left with no choice because the severance he was given was only enough to cover his mortgage for maybe the next three months. So he had to figure out something and he had to do this fast. Marty ends up being able to work at St. Peter's in Chattanooga and part time at St. Luke's in Cleveland just for some extra cash here and there. He continued his work with Camp Billy Johnson, Chattanooga Cares, the Integrity Chapter, still feeding, ministering and spending time with those in need. Meanwhile, Marty was lost, broken and struggling. He surrounded himself with people who loved him and he trusted, but he was so angry and hurt by Chris. He wanted to stay as far away from Thankful Memorial as possible because she was supposed to be his friend, leaving Marty to feel so betrayed by the community that he had been immersed in since going to seminary all of those years ago. For anyone, this would cause a crisis in their life and especially those who are rooted so deeply in the church. A church serves as a community, a moral compass, a home, a safe space for some, but especially for Marty. And you know, some Something that is not spoken on a lot is just how toxic it can be working for a church. I have personal experience with this because my pop pop was a Southern Baptist pastor for 50 years, pastoring 10 churches and raised in a family of pastors. My pop pop preached the gospel, making it clear that he was not a perfect man by any means. He preached about the only perfect man who ever lived. He was a Southern Baptist pastor who loved all, no matter who or how you love because he knew that is how Jesus loved which is why my pop pop and nana were later betrayed by the church and members of the congregation of this small conservative church in the backwoods countryside of Cleveland do y'all hear that thunder um sorry it is storming it is tornadoing basically outside scaring oh my god I sorry y'all okay um we'll keep going (laughs) but I tell you all of that about my pop-up I go on that whole rant about my pop-up who I love so dearly and wish he was here today to tell you that this is nothing new because if higher-ups in the church get into the right ears and heads your own circle can and will turn on you citing God as their reason not even three weeks ago the Christian Post writer Joseph Matera wrote an article about the ways pastors are abused by their churches Pastors, priests, and preachers are criticized for taking time off, for family, vacations, mental breaks. It doesn't matter. They are expected to spend every waking moment at the church, ready and willing to drop everything and show up for church members, but also having nice things. It's like they are expected to take a vow of poverty in order to fund their church, give gifts to members, etc. These individuals are constantly having their personal and private boundaries crossed. Nothing they ever do is right, facing gossip and slander regarding their leadership decisions, not to mention how everyone's emergency has to be their own emergency. It's so awful. Many of these church leaders feel as if they are being used, yet are not to expect anything in return other than people showing up each Sunday to hear their message and get a handshake as they walk in and out the door. They work insane hours. Literally, most have logged 60 to 80 hours each week, counseling, going to dinners, marrying members, writing their messages, planning events, and more, while being expected to have all of the answers. But if it's not the right answer, they are called an imposter. As they are facing all of this pressure, stress, and trying to keep a happy face, the only people they have to turn to are their mentors, their families, and their close friends. Yet they are left feeling scared and lonely that at any moment, these people would turn on them because that is what they are used to. It is straight up neglect and abuse. We are not saying that all priests, pastors, and preachers are abused or even good people. No shot. (laughs) No. (laughs) But it is worth noting just how stressful this job is. 
You are literally a guide for people's faith, their morals, and reasons for life. That is an immense level of pressure. And the moment you are betrayed or pushed out, you feel like you have lost everything. And some end up struggling with their own faith and moral values afterwards. In September of 1996, Michael, Marty's roommate and best friend, had the amazing opportunity to purchase a home in St. Elmo. He had saved up the perfect amount of money and it was closer to his job and school. So he jumped at the chance, purchasing the home and moving out of Marty's. But this was extremely hard for Marty. It really upset him because just of how crazy his life had been the past few months, he didn't want Michael to move out. He wanted him to stay. It made him feel like he wasn't alone. Michael promised Marty that he would always be over just a phone call away. And he knew all of this. And he knew that this is something that Michael had been working for for a long time. So who was he to hold him back? Was he hurt and feeling alone? Yeah. But they were in their mid-30s. This was bound to happen soon. February 22nd, 1997 was Marty's 35th birthday. Michael and all of his closest friends celebrated with him as he rang in this new year of his life. This was going to be a better year for Marty. Starting in May, there were little whispers around Thankful Memorial, though. It took over a year, but people were finally getting the truth behind what had really happened to Marty. Others' true colors were shining through. Bet they were. (laughs) Churchgoers were not happy, and they wanted Father Marty back at Thankful Memorial as rector. Marty was struggling with this because he wanted to go back home to Thankful and his followers from St. Mary's that he took over there, but he didn't know if this would be the smart thing for him to do because of everything that had happened with Chris. If Marty went back, he would become rector, meaning Chris would be fired. So on July 4th, 1997, Marty went to Huntsville, Alabama to meet with his longtime friend, Darlene. Darlene posed the question for Marty. Would this be justice for St. Mary's or vengeance for what Chris had done to him? Marty didn't want vengeance necessarily. He mainly just wanted to continue his fight for St. Mary's and their money that had been drained without their knowing. So Marty decided that he would prepare himself to present the truth to the ruling body of laity at Thankful Memorial. So basically this is the bishop, the priests, deacons, and like church leaders. He wanted to present them with everything that had gone on behind closed doors since and before the merger. He just mainly wanted them to know the truth. Michael wrote it best when sending Marty's case in to America's Most Wanted in 1998. Quote, doing this, Marty would expose the very top of the parish hierarchy, which would most likely lead to their embarrassing expulsion and a shocking blow to the congregation, centering around the financial wrongdoings that had began taking place after the merger. But Marty was never able to do this. On Wednesday, July 16th, 1997, Marty's across-the-street neighbor and friend, Steve, had woken up a little after 9 a.m., walked into his front yard to collect the morning paper, and let his dog use the restroom. According to WDEF News 12 Chattanooga, Steve watched as a young black male who looked to be roughly six foot tall in his teens to early 20s walked from the sidewalk and onto Marty's porch before entering the front door. It was normal for Marty to have people over, so this is not what caught Steve's eye. It was the fact that the man walked into the front door without knocking. Steve returned inside of his home and began watching Marty's house through his window blinds. Moments later, the man who had walked into Marty's came out of the front door holding a yellow envelope and hurriedly walked down the street. This gave Steve a bad feeling, so he called Connie, who is Marty's next door neighbor. Connie often watched Marty's dog Max and cat when he was out of town. Steve told Connie what he had just witnessed, expecting her to say like, oh, Marty's on vacation and that man is the house sitter. But Connie knew that Marty was at home, not to mention his car was parked out front and Marty always let her know when he would be out of town. Connie told Steve that she was going to go over and check on Marty. So the two walked over to Marty's front porch together and knocked on the door, but there was no answer. They started looking through the windows when they spotted Marty. He was lying motionless in a pool of blood. He was dead. They immediately called 911, and then Connie called Michael, who was at work. 
At this point, it's a little after 9.30 a.m., and Michael ran out of the hospital and drove straight to Marty's. There was crime scene tape, forensics teams, and detectives from the Chattanooga Police Major Crimes Unit questioning all of those who were around. The community was shocked to its core. Who would do this to Marty? He was kind, gentle, giving, and had no enemies. Everyone loved Marty. This made no sense. The murder was brutal and almost overkill, and the scene told a very interesting story. Every morning, Marty would wake up just after 8 a.m. He would let his dog Max out into the backyard, grab the newspaper from the front yard, pour a bowl of cereal and a glass of cranberry juice or Dr. Pepper. He would then let Max back inside before sitting down to read the paper and eat his breakfast. After this, he would shower and get ready for the day, and July 16th was a Wednesday, meaning that he was preparing to celebrate Mass at St. Peter's Episcopal, which started at 10.30 a.m., Therefore, he would have had to leave his home just before 10. Marty's home may have always been cluttered, but he was a man of routine and always on time. Marty looked to be in the middle of his routine that July Wednesday morning. On his breakfast table sat a bowl of untouched, freshly poured cereal and a full glass of cranberry juice beside the morning paper. Max was nowhere to be found, meaning that Marty never made it to let him back in. From the front door through Marty's bedroom, the hallway back bathroom, kitchen, and dining room were pools of blood, splatter, and smear. And according to his autopsy report, Marty sustained six to seven gunshot wounds, which I'm going to walk us through here in just a minute. But Marty had multiple abrasions, contusions, and bruises that were consistent with a severe physical struggle before death. Because I have the autopsy report here with me right now, I want to walk you all through the details of each injury to give you a better picture of what actually happened that morning. Marty's autopsy was performed by the Hamilton County Medical Examiner's Office by pathologist Dr. F.K. King Jr. Marty's body was taken to the MEO from the crime scene at 11.39 a.m. on July 16th by an ambulance, overseen by Detective Bowman of CPD Major Crimes Unit. His actual autopsy took place at 9.41 a.m. on July 17th, so the next morning. At the time of his death, Marty was 6'2 and 157 pounds. They classified his type of death as violent and noted that during his autopsy, his body was fully in rigor mortis and his liver or skin color was fixed purple. For a little bit of context, I'm going to go through the stages of rigor mortis, and this is according to Medicine Net. Um, zero to eight hours, the body begins to harden. However, it is still movable. Between 8 to 12 hours, the muscles become fully stiff and they'll stay like this until the 24 hour mark. Between the 24 and 36 hours, the stiffness will then begin to disperse and slowly the muscles will become flexible again. However, there are many things to take into account when examining a body experiencing rigor mortis, which is why it is not a concrete answer when it comes to determining a time of death, such as an individual's body chemistry. Rigor mortis is caused by chemical changes in the muscles, mainly calcium, Therefore, everyone's body will experience this at their own pace. But it also has to do with the temperature of the body and its environment. There are eight stages of death that pathologists must take into account. Number one, pallor mortis. This refers to the paleness of one's skin, and it's a result of the collapse of circulation throughout a body because of gravity, and this will later create liver mortis. The second one is algor mortis, and this is the changing of body temperature as the body begins to acclimate to the temperature of its surrounding environment. The third is rigor mortis, which we discussed. Um, the fourth is liver mortis, and this refers to the color of the skin. It is a result of blood settling with gravity. Algor, rigor, and liver mortis play a massive role in determining one's time of death with outside factors in mind. Liver mortis starts within 20 to 30 minutes after death, but cannot be observed by the human eye until two hours after death. At the eight to 12 hour mark, it becomes fixed in the body, giving it a purple, blue, red look. Number five is putrefaction, or the beginning stages of decomposition on a cellular level. The sixth is decomposition, the seventh is skeletonization, and the eighth is fossilization. 
Marty's teeth were in great condition, meaning that there was no damage. So there wasn't a broken tooth or anything like that. That's so odd. Right. And his esophagus had a brown tan semi-solid content. There were no food particles, pills, or foreign bodies found in his stomach, though. So to me, maybe it's like he took a bite of something and then went and answered the door or did whatever right before he was attacked. And then a toxicology report was ran on Marty that showed no signs of alcohol or drugs drugs in his system other than one prescribed medication that he had taken and they determined that there were no signs of sexual assault but let's go through the gunshot wounds in the autopsy report they are labeled a through h gunshot wound a was to his front left shoulder and the bullet was fired at close range leaving a st- stipple injury i think is how you pronounce it and it traveled from left to right meaning that his attacker was right-handed but the bullet traveled downward, which I'm going to get back to. Gunshot wound B actually was just a graze of his chin and never actually entered the body fully. And then gunshot wound C was to Marty's neck and it was front facing. The bullet entered right below his Adam's apple. So like right where that dip is on your chest. And it traveled downward, slightly left to right, through his thyroid, trachea, pericardium, right side of his ascending aorta, right pul- 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 Morgan? pulmonary, thank you, hilum, and lower right lung, stopping there and being located in the lower right chest cavity. Gunshot wound D entered through Marty's left temple traveled downward again and it was angled from left to right it passed through his left frontal bone brain and struck the inner side of his right temporal bone before ricocheting backwards and settling in the right temporal lobe this was again a close range gunshot with stipple injury gunshot wound e entered the back left side of marty's head and it was angled left to right in a downward motion and it passed through his left occipital bone stopping gunshot wound f entered through the back middle part of his head again angled slightly left to right traveling but this time in an upward motion this bullet actually ricocheted back and exited his skull creating gunshot wound g so it's not like its own separate shooting it's just where it was exiting the body And then we have gunshot wound H, and this one entered through his lower right back. This looks to have been done while Marty was laying face down on the ground and the bullet stopped in his lower right abdominal wall. After going through all of this, there is one thing that stands out to me, and that is the downward motion of all but one of the bullets, specifically gunshot wound C. In order for that bullet to travel the way it did, Marty would have been needing to like be on his knees with his head tilted back so that the shooter could have aimed the gun directly down his like abdomen. Right. But we know that there was a massive struggle and it was evident that Marty was running throughout his entire house during this attack. So how are all of these gunshot wounds traveling in a downward motion with him moving around? Tied up that's impossible because he's running around this right. doesn't even mention the fact that he's six foot two. Oh yeah and from the reports that i have read and people i've interviewed there were no signs of a forced entry and the attack began inside marty's front door like right at the entrance meaning that he would have had to let this person inside or at least open the door for them and they like push through what is odd about all of this is the fact that marty had just gotten out of bed like i'm talking hadn't showered and hadn't gotten dressed therefore he was still in his underwear which is what his body was recovered wearing the autopsy does not specify a time of death or an appropriate window of death from what i have read and what we know about this crime scene and marty's routine i want to assume that he was likely killed between 8 and 9 a.m but specifically i'm thinking like a little after 8 30 a.m investigators on the scene began looking for what it could have been that that man that steve saw walking out of marty's house was holding in that envelope and they began searching the home the yard and then they realized that marty's wallet was missing it took a few weeks or maybe even months but they were finally able to locate his wallet and it was at a gas station on the side of the road like tossed out of a car and the location of his wallet will come back in here later but i want to keep going for right now Nothing had been stolen out of it. All of his cards had not been used. Like everything was still there. So that kind of gets rid of a robbery. Right. So what was, did this man that Steve saw have in that envelope? The only way to find this out is by tracking this man down. Steve
Steve worked with police to create a composite sketch of this young man that he had seen, but there was no way that this kid would be able to commit the murder. He had only been in the home for one to two minutes, and there were no gunshots heard and no blood seen on this kid. It's not like this was a clean crime scene. Whoever did this would have been covered in head to toe with blood. Even still, investigators pursued lead after lead looking for this witness or suspect, whatever you want to call him, but mainly they just wanted to ask him questions. What were you going in there to get? Who sent you there? Why did you not call for help? Because there's no way you missed Marty's body that was laying right beside the front door. But they were never able to ask these questions because the man was never found. However, they believe that he is a local gang member from what tips they got sent in originally. So why would someone need to go back to the crime scene of a murder that they did not commit themselves? Possibly for proof? As in, was this same murder for hire? In my opinion, it seems a little too gruesome of a crime, if not sparked out of like rage or passion i agree and why would marty invite someone inside of his home at 8 30 in the morning like assuming that's the time while wearing his boxers also agree right and he would have to know them personally but again like who would want to do this to marty that knew him years went by and it seemed like every single lead was a dead end after dead end forcing marty's case to go cold crime stoppers even picked this up in like early 2000 hoping that this would spark up some new leads but again nothing happened. That is until 2007 when Marty's case was thrusted back into the headlines of the Cleveland and Chattanooga area after a witness came forward claiming that Cleveland's judge John Hagler, the guy from the small group and the attorney that he interviewed, I mean interned with, oh, shit. was carrying around a briefcase filled with first-hand murder tapes including one of Marty Davis's murder. Oh my gosh. In early 2004, 10th Judicial District Circuit Court Judge John Hagler, sorry, that is a mouthful of Cleveland, asked his secretary of 18 years, Nona Rogers, to, by the way, Nona? I've never, and it's spelled like Nona. My like your Nona. cat, yeah. I've never, ever heard anybody named I Nona. It. I love it. Um, Nona Rogers to transcribe this audio cassette tape for this legal matter that he was working on. And this was common for Nona as this was one of her many duties for the last 18 years. So Nona finished transcribing side A and finished the tape to get started on side B. As she's listening to the voice of Judge Hagler, she was numb and sick all over. This was not something that she was supposed to hear. And it was concerning Marty Davis. Nona knew Marty as he would call often to chat with Hagler and stop by even. The two were close friends from church and their time working together as when he was interning. What she was listening to was a crime. Nona hid this tape in her purse and took it home for her husband to hear, but he literally couldn't even make it through the horrific tape. Nona kept this tape to herself until she was fired after her husband decided to run for circuit court clerk in November of 2005. That next day, Nona took the tape to the Chattanooga Police Department, telling her family and friends, quote, if anything happens to me, it was Hagler. CPD sent this tape to the FBI, later explaining that the tape was of Judge John Hagler, recounting the dialogue of the murder and torture of Marty Davis in detail. Like, to himself? It was a graphic fantasy sort of way, while pleasuring himself. What? Judge Hagler worked overtime with DA of Cleveland Steve Bebs at the time to get this tape locked down and never released to the public. But... This was not the only tape he had reenacting murders. There were dozens more that were later destroyed. In January of 2008, Hamilton County Judge Frank Brown ruled that Hagler's torture tapes would remain the private property of Hagler and not be released to the public. Are you kidding? Right. Now, this is shocking, terrible, and just honestly jarring. That's not private property. That's borderline evidence. No, that is like, if it's if it's anything, it's reenactment, my ass. I'm First sorry. off, you're a judge. How do judge. you know that? Right. You're a judge. OK, like why? Why are you doing this? And you're a youth group leader at St. Luke's Episcopal in Cleveland. Yeah. So how is anybody going to feel comfortable with you? Like what? But what's really interesting is that some who've heard these tapes claim that there are the voices of two individuals on Marty Davis's 
two men. Because of this happening, Marty's case was all that anyone could talk about, making it to where lots of new information was trickling out, leading us to the theory section that Morgan is going to take us through. Oh, but before I do that, we are going to throw out a huge, 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 humongous disclaimer. Gigantic. Gigantic disclaimer that these are theories. These are theories. These are T-H-E-O-R-I-E-S. Right. Theories. And, and we didn't make them up. bold, red, capital letters. <laughs> we did not make these up. We did not make them up. These have but been talked about for a while. Our first theory, number one, Judge John Hagler. This theory has some major legs because of, well, the tape. <laughs> Literally. Personal connection to Marty and the fact that he would absolutely let Judge Hagler into his home. Oh, 100%. It was his friend. Some people even speculate that maybe Hagler and Marty were in a relationship together. Mm. And because of Marty planning to tell his church everything, there was going to be something that had to come out about Hagler in his relationship. Or, if not that... Possibly St. Luke's in Cleveland had some secrets that they didn't want getting out that surrounded Hagler. I mean, yeah. I mean, he was a youth group teacher for St. Luke's, like Taylor just said, and continued working there even after the tapes came out. Like, what? Had they known about this the entire time and Marty was just going to air out their dirty laundry? Probably. I mean, probably. I would. After all of the bullshit that Marty went through, mm-hmm. I would be I would be in there everyone telling everything. Out. Yeah. Absolutely. But of course, every time there's a theory, we have to dismantle mm-hmm. it. John Hagler was an old man and way smaller and shorter than Marty. There is no way that he could have done this personally to him like mm. physically yeah physically um the second there is very little to no actual motive in this theory at all mm-hmm. like he had no beef with Marty. right it's just all speculation um and the third Hagler would have had to hire someone to do this yes he would know the right people yes it does look like there's room for hire there yeah but there is absolutely no money trail or right. that we know of there that is no of, money least. trail <laughs> And he's apparently good at getting stuff covered up, so. Yeah, he's really good at that. Um, In my opinion, it is based on great reason, but it is extremely far-fetched. Marty's murder was at such a random time, it would only make sense if whoever did this was on a timeline of their own with their own vengeance. Mm -hmm. Which leads us to theory number two, Jim, Chris's husband. Jim had a current and real motive to want Marty dead with the history and resources to to make make it it happen. happen. Just a week before Marty's death was when he went to Huntsville to discuss returning to Thankful Memorial which would leave Chris without a job. Chris was the breadwinner of their marriage. They had just had a baby. They just bought a house. His wife could not lose her job. Right. Jim also had multiple public intoxication charges and two DUIs, and he had a severe drinking problem. So he wouldn't be able to get at least a good enough job to support the both of them while Chris looked for a new church. Right. Not even six months after Marty's murder, Chris left Thankful Memorial and moved to New York. Thankful Memorial, her baby. Her baby. The one she fought over, she moves to New York to get her doctorate at the General Theological Seminary. And a few months later, Bishop Bob Tharp goes to visit Chris at General Theological Seminary, and they went out to dinner. At this dinner, Chris's husband, Jim, was hammered. Oh, my God. And he was acting extremely inappropriate, which was making Chris very angry and it was giving Bishop Tharp a really bad feeling, a really bad vibe about really this guy. Really bad vibe. And after this, Jim went to prison on a lot of different charges. On many. Where he later died in prison of liver cancer. Wow. Jim was not a good dude. And this was worrisome for all of those surrounding Chris. And then Marty, because of what he was going to expose. Even police had off feelings about Jim and interviewed him three different times. But he had an alibi. He was at home with Chris and their new baby. Mm. But maybe Jim didn't do it himself. Maybe he hired someone to kill Marty. Our third is murder for hire. This theory has been a prevalent one for a few reasons. Though the murder seemed personal, it could have just been a result of the struggle Marty was putting up. 
Not to mention the fact that it'll be 25 years on this July 16th, 2022. Next week. If you're listening to this a couple of years from now, it's next week. Right. 2022. Since Marty's murder. If it was as simple as someone in Marty's life personally murdering him, don't you think it would have been a quick case to solve? I mean, yeah. A murder for hire would explain the little leads, the timing, the lack of evidence. The envelope. The envelope. Seriously, though. But who would call the hit? John Hagler? We know he had the resources, but still, we're lacking a credible motive. Could it have been Jim to call the hit? He also had the resources and the motive, but was he smart enough to pull this off? And would he have stayed quiet for all those drunken years? Probably not. Probably not. In those rageful years, like he was not a good dude. He's not a good dude. Most people don't think so. So who else would have done it? Maybe it was a crazed ex-lover, which brings us to our fourth theory. This is where we circle back to the location of Marty's wallet. During this time, it was known that the Chickamauga Dam was the meetup spot for LGBTQ plus members in the area. You would go there to meet others, ride around, and find someone to take home after a few dates. Mm -hmm. Marty would go there sometimes, but only during the day and never at night. And according to everyone who knew him, especially Michael, he was never the type to bring a stranger home. He was extremely careful because of the time, his job, and simply because it was dangerous. Marty must have been a true crime junkie. He was. (laughs) It is true that in the months leading up to Marty's death, Michael wasn't living with Marty and he was struggling. So we don't know the details in Marty's super personal life at this point. But Marty was not a crazed sex addict or a super private person in terms of his relationship with Michael. So he likely would have let someone know if he was frequenting the dam. What is really interesting about this theory is that it would explain why Marty would let a stranger in his home. Or maybe he had a person stay over that night. And maybe they murdered Marty. But what does the location of the wallet have to do with this theory? Well, Marty's wallet was found on the side of the road near a gas station on the route that he would have taken to the Chickamauga Dam. This might have been a red herring or even a message from the killer. And what's really interesting about this is that everyone that I speak to, they're pretty hung up on the location of this wallet and Marty's ties to the dam. But why why would, okay, if someone was guilty and they killed Marty and they have his wallet, why would they go back to the dam to throw it out maybe their car was there or they like got a ride there oh yeah because if we're saying like okay maybe he went to the dam that night and then picked up up someone we know his car was at home so someone would have had to like take him and then maybe he left and then maybe the male that ran in there to grab something Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. um anyway it makes us wonder if this was the doing of a closeted man yes marty had maybe been seeing at the time and again why a wednesday morning this would only make sense if it was a crime of opportunity which takes us down an entirely new path leading us to our fifth and final theory gang initiation this area of chattanooga is known for its gang violence and in order to be initiated into some of the gangs here that are prevalent in the area you must kill someone at random to be initiated which ties back to the fact that investigators believe the kid steve saw that morning was a local gang member right himself so like i wonder if they send someone in to like take pictures after the fact but like he didn't have a camera on him or they did take pictures stuffed it in the envelope then forgot it and right. he had to, he was the runner <laughs> he was the unlucky son of a bitch he pulled the short straw right yeah and why not solve this case if it was that simple though well maybe there are some informants for the chattanooga police department gang unit that are wrapped up in marty's murder that prevent them from closing marty's case <sighs> and we're gonna leave you with that yeah so these these theories are extremely relevant because of all of the I- information that has come out over the years and the evidence that has been released but what we do know is there is a ton of evidence and pieces to this case that have never and probably will never be released to the public until they solve this case if they solve it if they solve it if i think the reason it's not being solved is because it's being covered see i feel the same way and i i have a theory of my own okay let's hear it and this has no research behind it so no one come (laughs) for my throat don't come for us i think it is a dirty church network 
Dude, I think the church did it. Let me tell you something. If there's anything I learned from my grandfather being a pastor for all those years and everything that he went through with my Nana and just how much they gave and loved on these churches and how they were treated in the end, it is dirty. Church is a completely different level. No, they're all cults. It's literally, well, I wouldn't go that far. No. But, but we, we do know that there are a lot of cults, like we've discussed in the past, that use religion as a veil to protect them from law enforcement. If these other places, these bad people are using churches as a veil, then why wouldn't the current churches be using them? Right. I think that all of our theories kind of tie into one. Like, I think... Judge Hagler, I think Jim, and I think the church, I think it's all just one giant spider web of Mm -hmm. the right answer. Right. And there's just pieces. There's tons of pieces that, I mean, huge pieces to this case that are missing. Like, I literally, when when Ashley and I were discussing this, I was like, I have tons and tons and tons of content, but the issue is, is I have many holes. Yeah. So it feels like when I'm giving you this case, like I'm leaving out a ton, but it's because it's nowhere to be found. Yeah. This case, you can't just Google. Nobody has has ever covered Marty's case before we are the first ever to do it outside of people who are originally reporting on it in 97 and it is a extremely messed up case but okay before we end this up I we have a lot more that we actually are going to give you and I kind of want to talk about the location of Marty's case right now which is the Hamilton County DA's office cold case unit whenever I originally figured out where this was I was like where the hell is that yeah we haven't mentioned that at all in any of this no we haven't even like gone down this avenue yet so in on September 30th 2014 district attorney general Neil Pinkinson Pinkson I think so you say his name announced that he was going to be creating the cold case unit like literally a month after taking office he hired retired Chattanooga police captain Mike Mathis or Matthias um, I'm not really sure how you pronounce it to oversee this entire unit which by the way he's a super nice man I've talked to him probably 900 times on the phone and he's so tired of getting my phone calls but he's super kind (laughs) but anyways both the Chattanooga Police Department and the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office each assigned a detective to the unit which is dedicated to reviewing and investigating over 200 unsolved homicide and missing persons cases in Hamilton County. At any one time, these units are reviewing at least a half dozen of these cases and continually reprioritizing new leads as they go. This is really cool because what it does is it creates an entire place for these cold cases to go and still be actively investigated at a smaller level that is actually better in terms of ratios of detectives to cases. The first time I was hearing about this, I was like, what is this bullshit? Like it kind of seemed to me like a place to leave cases, like a place to put them so that they could be, quote, active and not pulled out by like private investigators or people that are looking into these cases but why, why would you make an entire unit with funding for that right they've actually solved like 31 of the 200 wow. in the last however many years it's been since 2014 yeah. which is a big deal but something really awful is actually about to happen to this cold case unit it's literally being dissolved by the new da that just got elected why and it's because of funding they don't want the money going to this cold case unit within the da's office they would rather hand it back to the police departments the first time i heard that it kind of like reinstated my thoughts of like maybe this is a place for them to go and be considered active so people can't look into them Mm -hmm. which would make sense to me why marty's was there if this is a cover-up but after doing more research and really like talking with the people in this unit I feel this was the a really great thing and I hate that it's going away all it's going to take for this case to get closed is just one person talking absolutely and we know these people that know the secrets that will end up breaking this case wide open all these missing puzzle pieces they're alive and well they're just holding this secret and let me tell you something if you hold something so deep and dark down in your soul it's gonna come back to bite you karma's a bitch and lauren taylor ag's sister said it best said it best if you know anything if you have any tips about what happened to marty davis that wednesday morning on july 16th 1997 please contact the hamilton county cold case unit at 423-209-7470 and you can literally ask 
ask for Mike on the phone. He will get on and talk to you about this case. Crime Stoppers, or you can reach out to the Chattanooga Police Department Major Crimes Unit, who was originally investigating this case and is about to have it back in their jurisdiction once again. But what's really scary about this case going back to the Chattanooga PD is if there's not a viable lead that is sent in in pressing, they're not going to investigate it. So Marty's case is just going to sit on a shelf somewhere. Marty deserves better. He gave all of his time and resources to others in need and now he needs us. He needs people to fight for him like he fought for so many others. He needed us 20 years ago. Right. Like so no better time than now. It's just been way too long and that's why I'm so thankful for Ashley and all the work that she's done on this case. She came in and married Yuri later on in life. Marty was already gone and Yuri didn't even really get the chance to get to know his brother Marty that well. So she comes in and she's like no we're gonna get this case solved and she did it she has worked more than any other person constantly calling the state and getting documents sent to her she's amazing she's done an amazing job and she's created any social media form called justice for marty you can follow them on twitter on reddit on facebook on instagram anywhere now we're going to leave you guys with a message from ashley thank you guys so much for listening to us please dig into this case and tell people about it because we want to make sure that marty's case is reopened by the Chattanooga Police Department the second they get it and solved. Marty loved big and he really wanted to pour that love onto everyone around him so much so that he devoted his whole life to helping other people and it's really sad to see someone that gave so much to their community around them is just a 25 year old unsolved murder case someone out there knows what happened to Marty and really the only way that we can get any movement on this case is to be talking about it and really give him back his voice that he lost so long ago he championed for other people so much in life, it's only fair that we champion for him now.